Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining me today. So I wanted to start by asking you a question. Have you had a cup of coffee or tea today? Or have you done some exercise? Or maybe have you smiled at a baby or at someone you love? Well, if you've done any of these things, then you've been meddling with your own brain chemicals. But what exactly does that mean? So as um, Lisa just said, my name is Ginny. I'm a science writer and presenter with a background in psychology and neuroscience. I've always been curious, wanting to understand why and how the things around me work. But it wasn't until university that I discovered brain science. Here was a real challenge, a complex system full of mysteries and unknowns that needed breaking down and understanding at the most fundamental level. And not only that, but it was something that affected us all every day. I was hooked and I felt like maybe here was a, a way to answer that most fundamental question of all. Why do we behave the way we do? As I learned more about neuroscience during my degree and then in the 10 years I've been working as a science communicator since, I began to realize that while the cells that make up our brain are really, really important, it's the chemicals that bathe them and allow them to communicate that paint all the complex details which color every aspect of our daily lives. More recently, I began to see these chemicals popping up in the media with headlines like serotonin is the happiness chemical or dopamine is addictive. And I realized that these were an oversimplification, a huge oversimplification, so much that they were pretty much meaningless. They, these chemicals just aren't as simple as having one effect. And even if eating a certain food could boost your serotonin levels, it wouldn't be the panacea that they seemed to be promising. So I pitched the idea of a book about brain chemicals to Sigma, and they liked it. Great, I thought, dopamine coursing through my motivation system. I'm going to write a book explaining exactly how these chemicals really work in the brain and how they affect all the different aspects of our lives. Flash forward a few months and you would find me head in my hands at the kitchen table lamenting for what felt like the hundredth time just how complicated a topic this is and wondering why I had picked it as a topic for my book. Because it turned out that the chemical systems in our brain are even more complicated and intricate than I had realized. And the amount that we don't know about them is enormous. Never one to shy away from a challenge, though, I plowed on. Each chapter of the book, I decided I would focus on a different aspect of life, from hunger and sleep to love and decision making. So I began to research these topics, to read, to talk to scientists. And as I did, I began to find stories in each one of them. Stories of scientists' curiosity and persistence in the face of huge challenges and how the discoveries they made changed our understanding of our brains. And as I delve deeper into the cutting edge research, that's revealing the unexpected connections between these crucial chemicals, some patterns began to emerge. And it's these patterns that I'd like to share with you today. But before we start looking at that, I need to give you a little bit of background about the brain. So um, I have a uh, model here of the brain. Um, so this is roughly life size for an adult human brain. Um, and inside this, you've got about 86 billion neurons or nerve cells, and they're sending electrical messages all around the brain and to the rest of your body. But it's what happens between these neurons that's particularly important for our story. So if I um, click over to this, you can see here a little animation of a neuron. And what happens is the signal comes in at the top there, it travels electrically down the neuron, and then it reaches a gap 
which is known as a synapse. And to get across to the next neuron, chemicals known as neurotransmitters are released. Those neurotransmitters are taken up by the second neuron and cause it to change. So in this example, that neurotransmitter is what we call excitatory. So it's causing the second cell to fire, to send its own electrical signal. So that means that in this animation, we're probably using the chemical glutamate, which looks a little bit like this. But there are chemicals that do different things. There's one that does the opposite, that makes it less likely that the next neuron will fire. That's called GABA, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But neurotransmitters can also cause longer term changes in the second neuron. Um, and that's actually how a lot of these processes work, not just through that simple up or down mechanism. And one of the reasons this is so important is this is where our brain can change most easily. And this is where we can learn. So when you activate two neurons together over and over again, both of those neurons start to change. The first one starts to release more of that glutamate, that excitatory neurotransmitter, when the signal comes in. And the second one can start to grow more receptors. And that makes the signal easier to pass between them. And that's exactly what's happening when we learn something new. Okay, so that is your neuroscience basics. Now we can start talking about those big themes that I found when I was writing the book. The first of them is the idea that the brain is made of networks, not just areas. Now, this is quite a new idea. For decades, scientists have been finding the region that does vision or the region that does decision making. And you'll still see some of that throughout um, this talk and in the book as well. Before fMRIs were discovered, however, fMRIs gave us the chance to actually look inside a functioning human brain and see what's going on. And before that, it was quite a challenge to work out what areas did what. But it was one that scientists didn't shy away from. So one of my favorite characters in the book is called Constantine von Economo, and this is him. He was the son of Greek aristocrats, born in Romania, and he trained as a doctor, but then he ended up working as a fighter pilot in the Austrian Air Force during the First World War. His parents didn't like the idea of him being in danger, however, so he was brought back to Vienna, where he began working as a military physician, caring for people with head injuries. He noticed this really unusual disease started popping up, and he began studying patients with what he called encephalitis lethargica, although it was better known as sleepy sickness. And he found that this disease damaged their brains. There were people with this disease who had different clusters of symptoms, and he found that those different patients had damage in two different parts of an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is deep within the brain. One cluster of patients suffered from insomnia, and they had damage at the back of their hypothalamus. Another group were really lethargic, often falling into a deep sleep and becoming difficult to wake, and sometimes ending up in a coma. The damage in those patients was at the back of the hypothalamus. So von Economo called these two areas the sleep and wake centers of the brain. Now, since his time, we've discovered that while regions of the brain are important, um, these aren't the only regions that are involved in sleep and wake. In fact, we have sleep and wake networks, and these stretch all the way throughout our brain from our brain stem, which is right at the base going down into our spinal cord, all the way to the cortex, which covers the whole of the surface of your brain. And this is part of that new revolution that I mentioned, this idea that we're moving away from specific brain areas and towards brain networks when we talk about everything from sleep and wake to love and decision making. Partly this um, change in understanding is down to better technology. And that's allowed us to realize that these networks each use different combinations of chemicals. So our sleep network, for example, releases a neurotransmitter called GABA into the cortex. And GABA, as I mentioned earlier, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. 
So that means if you release lots of it into your neurons in the cortex, they're going to fire less. So GABA effectively calms down your cortex, calms down the outer layer of your brain, and that helps you slip into sleep. And the neurons that do this, they start right in the part of the hypothalamus that von Economo called the sleep center. The wake system uses a whole range of different neurotransmitters, including dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, glutamate, histamine, and perhaps most importantly, acetylcholine, which looks a little bit like this. Acetylcholine activates neurons in the cortex, so that makes you feel awake and alert, so it has the opposite effect to the sleep system. And all of these complex pathways in the wake system pass through the hypothalamus again, right in von Economo's wake center. So he was right that those two areas were vital. It's just that there are lots of other parts of the brain, a big network, not just that specific region. And that's the only part that's important. You can think about our sleep and wake systems as a bit like a seesaw. So in order to flip you from sleep to wake or in the other direction, the brain has to sort of flip a switch or tilt the seesaw. Now to prevent this from happening too quickly, the two systems also inhibit each other. So when you're asleep, the sleep system inhibits the wake system and vice versa. And they're also stabilized by another chemical, which is called orexin. And this is the chemical that goes wrong in the condition narcolepsy. So we think that's why people with narcolepsy fall asleep when they shouldn't, because that stabilizing system isn't there. So you can see it's not just one region that controls even something as seemingly simple as sleep or wake. It's a complex network using a whole host of different chemicals. But just to make things even more complicated, it turns out the same chemical can have different effects, depending on the receptors that it's detected by. So Overloaded is a book about chemicals, but releasing neurotransmitters is only half the story. And it's actually the next part of the story that determines how that chemical is going to affect your behavior. Once the chemicals are released into the synapse, they travel across to the second neuron, and bind to receptors, which are found in the membrane sticking slightly out of the second neuron. It's this binding that changes the activity of that neuron, and so changes our behavior. And that means receptors are, if anything, more important than the chemicals. I'll give you an example. Humans are pretty unusual in the mammal world in that we are somewhat monogamous. This um, was, and sorry, and a lot of what we know about uh, monogamy in animals actually comes from a happy accident. Scientists were conducting a survey of rodents around the university they worked in, trapping them and recording them and then releasing them again. And they noticed that one particular animal called a prairie vole kept turning up in pairs. This is really unusual. There are almost no other rodents that are monogamous. So this led to decades of work on these furry critters, trying to find out what made them form these bonds. And what was really handy is they have a very closely related species called montane voles that are identical in almost every other way, but they don't form pair bonds. So scientists could compare what was going on in the brains of these two different closely related creatures. And they found that the bonding in prairie voles was down to two very closely related chemicals, oxytocin, which looks like this, and vasopressin, which is very, very similar. But what's really interesting is that if you take a montane vole and give it a dose of oxytocin or vasopressin, it doesn't suddenly become monogamous. And the reason for this is because of differences in the receptors they have in their brains for this chemical and whereabouts in the brain they're found. So prairie voles have oxytocin and vasopressin receptors in what we call the reward circuits of the brain. So circuits that give that feeling of reward that drive you to do something. And there's a whole chapter on them in the book. 
We know that in most animals, when you have sex, it releases oxytocin. So with prairie voles, when they mate with their partner, that gives them a rewarding feeling. They learn to associate that with their partner, and that drives them to want to be together. But giving it to montane voles doesn't have the same effect because they don't have receptors in the right parts of the brain. And this isn't just a between species difference. It turns out prairie voles aren't the perfect partners that scientists first thought they were. They do cheat. That means that some males never form pair bonds. They just live the bachelor life, mating with the occasional female behind her partner's back and leaving another male to help raise their kids. Researcher Larry Young discovered that these wanderers, as he called them, had genetic differences that meant that they had fewer vasopressin receptors in certain brain areas. And he thinks that's what causes them to live this different lifestyle. So does any of this apply to humans is the big question, because we're quite different to voles. But it turns out that we also have receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin in brain areas that are linked with love. So our reward systems and also emotional areas, including the amygdala. And men with genes that mean that they have fewer vasopressin receptors are more likely to report marriage problems and have lower satisfaction when they are in relationships. So it does seem like we might also be affected by these chemicals when it comes to pair bonding. It's clear that receptors are vital in order for a chemical to function. But to add an extra layer of complexity, many chemicals have multiple receptors. So dopamine, for example, has, we think, five families of receptors. And different receptors can have opposite effects. So to see this clearly, we can look at the decision-making system. If we look in the prefrontal cortex, right at the front of the brain, we find two different dopamine receptors involved in decision-making. One of them, when activated, tips the balance towards riskier options. The other one tips it towards safer choices. This might explain some of the differences we find between individuals when it comes to risk-taking. So someone who has more of the first receptor might be more of a risk-taker. It could also explain how our risk-taking behavior can change over the course of our lives, as the number of each receptor in our brain can be altered. So we can see it's nowhere near as simple as one chemical having one role, even when we look within a single area or single network of the brain. This is what makes me so cross at marketing that aims to persuade you to buy or do something to boost your serotonin or hack your dopamine levels, because it's so much more complicated than they made out. Changing the levels of neurotransmitters could have different effects in different people, depending on what receptors they have in each brain region. And maybe more fundamentally, just because you need something to function, that doesn't mean that more of it is better. The brain is all about balance. So sticking with dopamine for a minute, there are people whose brains don't produce enough of this chemical. And those people have a condition called Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's is characterized by the death of neurons in the substantia nigra, which is in the midbrain, sort of just above your spinal cord. And the substantia nigra has neurons in it that produce most of the brain's dopamine. So if this area is damaged, there's very little dopamine throughout the whole brain. This can lead to various symptoms, including difficulty with movements and balance and tremors, in, particularly in the hands. So these people are often prescribed drugs to boost their dopamine levels. The problem is these drugs can have side effects. And the most surprising of these are grouped together as the impulse control disorders. So some people who take these dopamine boosting drugs end up developing a gambling habit. Others start binge eating. 
Some become hypersexual and others develop compulsive shopping habits. All of these seemingly quite different um, habits are driven by intense cravings, which the person struggles to control. It turns out that boosting their dopamine might have helped them to move, but it's also affected their motivation circuits. They become more reward driven, more motivated to seek out their high of choice, whether that's a flutter on the GGs or a new pair of shoes. In rare cases, they can even become addicted to their medication, taking more than is needed to control their symptoms. These cases are quite unusual, but they highlight a couple of important points. The first one is that while too little of one of these chemicals can definitely be bad news, that doesn't mean that having loads of them flooding or overloading your brain with them is a good thing. Dean Burnett uses a great analogy in his book, Psychological, um, about salt in food. So if you have a plate full of food that has no salt in it at all, it might taste quite bland. But if you completely covered your plate with salt, it would taste even worse. There's a sweet spot when it comes to seasoning your food, and that can be different for each person. And the same is true when it comes to brain chemicals. So low serotonin levels might, in some cases, lead to depression, but high levels have been linked to anxiety. So there's a Goldilocks point, and deviating in either direction can cause problems. And of course, there might be different sweet spots in different parts of the brain or different brain networks. The second point that this uh, dopamine drug example highlights is the fact that the drugs we currently use for the brain are a bit of a blunt instrument. Chemicals tend, can have different effects on different regions or networks of the brain, as we've seen, or even within the same area, depending on the receptors. And our current drugs aren't sophisticated enough to target just the areas that need targeting. They tend to affect the whole brain, wherever there are receptors, not just the parts that need the change. And this is one of the reasons why drugs often have side effects. And that's why I hope that things will change in the future. But things are actually starting to improve already in terms of targeting rather than overloading. I'll give you an example of histamine. Now, histamine is the chemical that makes you itchy when you're allergic to something, and blocking it using an antihistamine drug can help relieve the symptoms of hay fever or pet allergy or whatever it is that's making your immune system overreact. But in the brain, it has another role. More histamine is released when we're actively vigilant versus quiet wakefulness. So it's one of those chemicals that helps us feel alert. Now, does anyone remember taking antihistamines before non-drowsy ones were brought in? My mum has told me about how awful she found it sitting her exams in the summer at school. She's always had very bad hay fever, and she used to have to choose between feeling groggy and sleepy and struggling to remember the answers in the exams, or spending the whole time sneezing with her eyes streaming. The reason for this is because older antihistamines can cross the blood-brain barrier. This is a membrane that separates our main blood system from the fluid that bathes the brain. It's really important because while it allows through vital molecules like glucose that our brain needs to fuel it and some hormones and other chemicals, it blocks most pathogens, things that might harm it and other, other things that it thinks might harm it. Because the older antihistamines could pass through the blood-brain barrier, they could block histamine receptors in the brain, and that made people feel sleepy. Modern allergy drugs can't get through the blood-brain barrier, so they don't have the same effect on making you feel tired. But the older ones are actually still in use. They're the main component of a lot of over-the-counter sleep aids because of histamine's role in preventing us from dropping off. So this is a really basic example of what's known as a targeted drug. We know the effect we want the drug to have, in this case, anti-allergy. 
And to get that effect, we need it in our body, but not in our brain. So scientists devised a drug that did just that. But what if we could find a way to be even more specific, targeting a particular area or network of the brain? If we could do this, we could reduce the risk of side effects and people could take much lower doses. It might sound like a bit of a pipe dream, but in another area of healthcare, it's actually already possible. Chemotherapy is given for cancer and it's uh, various different types of drug which damage cancer cells. But it's given in the bloodstream, which means it travels all throughout the body. And that means it can damage healthy cells as well. It's because of this that we get side effects like hair loss, nausea, and fatigue. Other cancer treatments, like radiotherapy, target tumors more precisely. And newer chemotherapy drugs are being developed that do a similar thing. While they're still given in the blood, they bypass the body's healthy cells and latch on to just the faulty ones, preventing them from functioning. The exact same techniques used in targeted chemotherapy are unlikely to work in the brain, but the idea is similar. Can we devise a way to deliver a drug directly to the malfunctioning area without affecting healthy brain cells? But to do this, we need to know which networks to target in each individual person. This requires not just a better understanding of the fundamentals of brain science, but also a personalized approach to medicine. Each of our brains is unique, built originally from our genetic blueprint, but shaped by our experience. Some diseases like Parkinson's do affect most people's brains in pretty much the same way. But when it comes to other conditions, it can be more complex particularly mental health conditions. In some cases, for example, in depression, we actually think there might be different underlying causes for the same condition, the same outcome. I talk about this in my mood chapter. I go into several possible causes of depression from an overactive stress response system to too many of a particular type of serotonin receptor that shuts off the release of serotonin or even to inflammation in the body. And different people might have different combinations of these that lead to their depression. At the moment, treating depression with antidepressant drugs is a bit of a case of trial and error. Doctors don't know before they try them which drug will work in which person. And it might be partly because they have different underlying causes. In the future, I'd love to see a world where we can scan the brain or test the blood of someone with a mental health condition and determine which drug would suit them best and where their treatment should be targeted. This is a little way off, but I do think it's realistic in the future. I just want to point out that while our current drug treatments aren't perfect and they can have side effects, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take them. They are the best treatments we currently have for many mental health conditions, often alongside other therapies, but they can be really effective. I just want you to imagine how much more effective they could be with this personalized, targeted approach. Luckily, we don't only have to rely on drugs to alter our brain chemicals. We can also use our behavior. So our brain and our brain chemicals are fluctuating, not predetermined. One example of this comes from pain. When we hurt ourselves, our sensors in our skin uh, send signals from the damaged area to our brain, and that produces the sensation of pain. But there's another pathway running in the opposite direction that allows the brain to shut down the pain pathway, for example, when we're experiencing intense stress. This starts with neurons in the cortex, that surface layer of the brain, and also in the amygdala deep inside and the hypothalamus. The activation of the stress system in these areas causes the release of natural opioids, for example, this one, and natural cannabinoids, for example, this one. 
These are both chemicals that are related to drugs uh, that are used um, for pain treatment and sometimes recreationally. So opioids uh, are related to the active ingredient in morphine and heroin, and cannabinoids are similar to the active ingredient in cannabis. So when our stress system is activated, we release these chemicals into an area of the brain called the periaqueductal gray or PAG, because it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, which is found in your brain stem in that bit that connects the brain to the spinal cord. Just like when you give someone morphine, using these internal painkillers activates our descending pathway and that blocks pain signals from coming up to the brain. So reducing the sensation of brain of pain, sorry, not brain. Um, this is known as stress-induced analgesia when it happens because of the stress response and can lead to amazing feats like soldiers walking for miles on a broken leg to get to safety. But it turns out we can activating it, activate it without such a dramatic environment, even just by swearing. So researchers have found that people can keep their hand in iced water for longer if they're shouting a swear word than if they're shouting a word about a table. And if you decide to try that experiment at home, I would love to see a video of you doing it because it sounds hilarious. Um, what the researchers think is that because swearing is a little bit naughty, it's something you shouldn't really be doing, it activates the stress system, releasing those opioids and providing pain relief. We also know that distraction can act as a painkiller. So some research found that if people who have uh, severe burns, when they have their dressings changed, it's very, very painful. But if they're wearing VR headsets, virtual reality headsets, and playing an immersive game, it's much less painful for them. They've also uh, put people in scanners and asked them to learn to distract themselves from pain. And it turns out people can do that. And when they do, the PAG becomes more active. This suggests that the distraction technique works through the same sort of mechanism as stress-induced analgesia. It's causing our brains to release those natural painkillers. And in fact, blocking opioid receptors weakens the effect that distraction has. So that suggests that our behavior is changing the chemicals that are released into our nervous systems. This might sound quite amazing, but actually this is known as a form of top-down control. Top-down control allows our brain to have control over more basic processes. And there's nothing special about pain. It allows us to exert control over all sorts of things, our drives and our instincts. But there's a bit of a problem here when I try and explain this to people. And it's a problem of language. Because when I talk about us exerting control over our more basic instincts, in both cases, I'm talking about our brains because we are our brains and they are us. So you, can't, you don't really have the language to talk about them separately. But the area of the brain where our consciousness seems to have the most control is the frontal lobe right at the front of the brain, and particularly what are known as the prefrontal regions just behind your forehead. This is the area of the brain that is most overdeveloped in humans compared to other animals. And it's where processes like reason, um, decision making, planning, that sort of thing live. We call these processes executive function. Damage to the prefrontal cortex can cause all sorts of problems depending on whereabouts that damage is. And problems with this region have been associated with things from poor decision making to overeating and even drug addiction. What happens if this area isn't functioning well is that we have difficulty modulating and inhibiting our basic drives. I like to think of this region as where that kind of little voice in your head sits, you know, the one that tells you that you've probably had enough cake, even when you really fancy another slice. But it turns out that engaging our prefrontal cortex is quite difficult. It takes energy and it takes effort. You can see this when it comes to decision making. You can think of your decision making selves as two people battling it out for dominance. 
There's our emotional system, driven mostly by dopamine in an area of the brain known as the nucleus accumbens, which is crying out for reward. It's a bit like a toddler. Once it's set its sights on that piece of cake, it's going to throw a tantrum until it gets it. But then there's our reason system in that prefrontal cortex. And that's like the harried parent trying to control the over-emotional toddler. But just like a parent, when our brain is busy or stressed or tired, it can't always face saying no to the screaming child. Sometimes it's easier to just give in and give it what it wants. And that's why we can make poorer decisions when we're tired, stressed or overwhelmed. But knowing this is half the battle. Because the more we know about our inbuilt drives and tendencies, the more we can practice exerting control over them or find ways to get around them in other ways. So, for example, if you know that whenever you go into the kitchen, you're tempted by the sight of the biscuit tin, you might try to hide the biscuit tin in a high cupboard so that you're not looking at it as often and it's not producing those uh, desire reactions. You're using your logical forward thinking prefrontal regions to override the desires and instincts initiated by the impulsive reward networks. As we learn about our unconscious biases, the biases that affect all of us without us even knowing it, we might decide to build techniques into recruitment that ensure we get the best candidate, which might not always be the one that our biases tell us to go for. And if we know we have a tendency to become stressed or overwhelmed by the news, we might make a conscious decision to check it once a day and turn off our phone notifications so that we're not constantly being dragged in and doom scrolling. All of these examples have us making decisions in advance when our executive control is probably functioning better rather than in the heat of the moment when stress, hunger or overwhelm might change our dominant chemicals and cause us to be driven more by our desires and emotions. It might be our brain chemicals that give us these underlying tendencies, but they also give us the flexibility to change and adapt them to improve the way we live our lives. From moods to pain, our brain chemicals affect every aspect of our lives, and we've seen how dysregulation can lead to all sorts of problems. But they also allow us to change, grow and adapt shaping our incredible complex brains through our actions and allowing us to build the brain and the life that we want for the future. And I think that's worth celebrating.